We're in a series about spiritual warfare. And the week before that, the weeks before that, we talked about fasting and praying and how powerful that is. How of you guys are experiencing a change in your life and your relationship with God through prayer and fasting? It's making a difference in my life. Look at me. Look at me. Don't ignore this. This is something that God has uh, ordained for us so that we can walk in uh, victory. We can walk in power. There's a particular missionary that I just absolutely love. His name is David Hogan. And this is a guy who goes after God radically. I mean, this is a radical dude. And the Lord has used him in mighty ways. And he says, when he went there, it was a struggle. It was a learning process. And God was patient and kind. And he says, and this is the one thing that I found that we had more victory in our lives than any other thing, and that is prayer and fasting. He says, fasting is, is dynamite to our prayers. Fasting is those things, submitting to God, humbling ourselves before God, and allowing God to come in and work. And we're interceding for others around us in that time of fasting. There's something about sacrifice. God operates powerfully in sacrifice. Your salvation was through sacrifice. And God's called us to be like him. And we're to sacrifice things as well. And one of those things is fasting. And there's lots of ways. And so check those out. If you have any questions about it, check out the sermons in the past on that, on our webpage. But in that line of spiritual warfare, uh, we've been talking about the blood of Jesus Christ. Last week we talked about it. This is the final part of it. This is appropriating the blood of Jesus for our lives. And, um, and before we get going any further... I'm going to hop over here and change the subject real quick because I have it on my notes. I, w I wanted to do this last week. I want to give a testimony to how good God is. Um, in our home small group that we had when we was doing that small group there, um, we pray for each other afterwards. And so we, anybody have a prayer request? And so we're praying and loving on each other. And then we got through praying. And then my wife says, hey, I have a prayer request. And, and she started crying because to her it was very serious. And she goes, Terry's been going through some major pains at night. And what it is, I'd wake up like 3 a.m. or 1 a.m. And for like two to three hours, I'd be just in pain. I, could, I just walk. It's like, uh, uh, trying different stretches, whatever it may be, casting it out, binding it, whatever it may be. I'm praying. And, and I mean, it hurt so bad that it even started transferring to my spine in the back. And I couldn't, my back hurt so bad. I'm just, I was in a lot of misery. And I'm pretty tough. <laughs> no, really, I am. <laughs> but anyway, I was in a lot of pain. And it kept me up for hours. And this started happening on a regular basis. And I kept thinking, this is spiritual. I know it is. And, but I, and then again, I thought it was gas. And I'm being honest. I'm not trying to be funny. <laughs> and so and I just it, I wake my wife up. And so that's probably why she was crying and praying. Will you guys please pray for my husband? And they said, come on, Terry, stand in the middle. And they laid hands on me. I have yet to have another attack like that again. I have yet to have another attack like that again. And I'm grateful for the prayers of my brothers and sisters. And again, I believe it was a spiritual thing. I believe it was a spiritual thing. So hallelujah. So we want to we know how to live a life of victory. And that's what spiritual warfare is all about. Hallelujah. So uh, I want to just give a quick recap of last week. Last week we talked about the story of the Passover. If you guys remember the Passover is when uh, Israel was over in Egypt. They were held captive by Pharaoh. And then he was uh, killing them, killing their babies, throwing them in the river, putting labor upon them and treating them as slaves. And they were slaves and it was terrible. And they cried out to God and they didn't even know God. But they cried out and God heard their prayers and he sent a man by the name of Moses. And Moses decreed, said, hey, let God's people go so they can worship him. And he wouldn't. He says, I'm going to give you opportunities. And God sent 10 plagues. And, and the first one was small. And then they kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger, trying to get a hold of Pharaoh's heart, saying, let go of them. Let go. And, you know, Pharaoh, he just had a hard, proud heart. And clear up to the uh, ninth one, and it just kept getting worse and more dangerous. And finally, God says, tonight's the night. He's going to cave. And I'm going to send my death angel. I'm going to send a death angel and he's going to come and he's going to kill the firstborn male in every single household everywhere, including the animals. This will get his attention. And the only way you're going to escape it, Israel, Jews, the only way you are is if you have a sacrificial lamb, a spotless lamb. Bring that lamb into your home. And what you're going to do is you're going to kill that lamb. You're going to catch the blood in the basin. And then with a little hyssop plant, you're going to dip it in that blood, and you're going to sprinkle it over the, the doorpost of your home. It's going to cover your home. 
You do this and you put your faith in this and you stay in that home and you will be saved. God provided a way to save them. And that's exactly what happened. They were saved, whereas all the Egyptians who did not follow that, they, their firstborn males were all killed. And there was crying out, including Pharaoh's son. He was killed as well. So God created a sacrificial lamb and he did everything. And they had to, the thing is this, they had to obey it. They had to do everything that they were supposed to do and they were saved. The Bible tells us that Jesus is yours and my sacrificial lamb. He's our Passover lamb. I want to read you two quick scriptures in John 1, 29. It says this. The next day, John, John the Baptist, he saw Jesus coming toward him and he said, look, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He said, there's your lamb. You guys before you were relying upon all these sacrifices to save you. And that's what God told you to do. But God is sending his own lamb to permanently take care of the problem of sin in our lives. Amen? And then 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, it says this. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed. You were redeemed from an empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors. No, how were you redeemed? It was by the precious blood of Christ, the lamb without blemish or defect. So 2,000 years ago when Jesus died on the cross, willingly laid his life down. His blood was spilt. And we learned that uh, his blood is applied to our lives in seven different ways. And, uh, but 2,000 years ago, Jesus' blood was poured out for you and I. And now what we need to do, like the Jews did when they caught the blood in the basin of the lamb, we need to apply the blood of Jesus to our lives. And the only way you can be saved is when you put your faith and hope in what Jesus has done for you. And how do we apply that? Let's take a quick look at that. Romans 10, 19 says this. Let's read it together. Ready? One, two, three. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. Church, if we are trusting and leaning on that cornerstone of Jesus Christ and what he did for us, we will be saved. And it's our confession is the hyssop that we put in the blood of Jesus and we applied it over our lives. It's your confession. I believe, but now confess with your mouth. Jesus, I need you. I confess that you are God. I confess that you're the only way, you're the only sacrifice for me to be with the Father. I need you. Save me. That confession right there is what saves us. That's the hyssop in the blood of Jesus applied to our lives. And so last week we talked about how the blood of Jesus has many other benefits that God wants to, for us to have. And if we're going to have victory over the devil in our lives, because the devil lies to us and he beats us down every single day, every single hour. He won't leave us alone. The only way we're going to have victory over him is when we start confessing the things of God. Hallelujah. When we start believing what God says instead of believing what the enemy says about us. When we start believing what God says about our eternity and our future and our salvation instead of believing our emotions, which the enemy manipulates all the time. God says, trust in me, trust in me. And so we want to confess it. Again, we're talking about spiritual warfare. So how do you overcome that enemy that's constantly lying to you, constantly uh, condemning you, constantly saying you are not good? How do we do that? He's the accuser of the brethren. The Bible says in Revelation 12, 11, and they, that's believers, they overcame him, that's the devil, they overcame him. How? By the blood of the lamb, Jesus, and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. God wants you to be an overcomer, church. He wants all of his church to be overcomers. He doesn't want his church defeated and broken. Yeah, we will go through some hard times. I'm not saying that. We'll go through some difficult times. We'll go through sickness just like the rest of the world. We'll go through the hardships of uh, the things around us and the brokenness around us. But the thing is, it doesn't overcome us. We overcome it by the blood of Jesus Christ and by our faith in Jesus and by the word of God in our lives. So hallelujah. God wants you to be an overcomer. And like salvation, that overcoming comes through the blood of Jesus Christ. And by the way, the blood of Jesus Christ has already been spilled. Now we have to make the confession, right? God has done his part. He doesn't need to do it again. Now we need to do the part for ourselves. And, uh, and it's through our testimony. It's through our confession that we are saved. And it's also through our testimony and our confession that all the benefits 
of the blood of Jesus can be applied to our lives. This is something I'm going to put up there and we're going to read it together. One, two, three. We overcome Satan when we testify personally to what the Word of God says the blood of Jesus does for us. Hallelujah. That's how we overcome things in our lives. You may be thinking, I've been a Christian for a long time. How can I overcome this in my life? How can I overcome the anger? How can I overcome the doubt? How can I overcome the fear? How can I overcome my relationships? How can I be an overcomer? Well, two things, the blood of Jesus and confession. We're not just talking positive thinking, wishful hope. We're talking about saying, Lord, this is what your word says, and I'm going to agree with your word about what it says about my life. Amen? I may not see it right here now. I may not even feel different. And then again, you may. But I'm telling you, when you start applying the blood of Jesus Christ, it will do what it says it will do. It will protect you. It will cover you. It will save you. It will sustain you. It will make you an overcomer. Amen? But it's when we apply our faith, the hyssop, our faith, and apply it to our lives. And we do it by confessing. Isn't that amazing? God created the universe with words. Our salvation comes through our confession and what Jesus has done. Our victory over the enemy comes through our confession. Words are powerful. There's life and death in this in our tongue. Amen? And it's not just talking about your relationships. It's talking about everything about us. Hallelujah. So we need to believe that. It's our cornerstone that God has for us in trusting the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. So, testimony, by the way, it simply means saying the same thing as what God says. Lord, you say this about me. I'm going to say the same thing. Lord, you say this about sin. I'm going to say the same thing about sin as well in my life. Amen? Uh, it's saying the same thing as testimony is like that little hyssop. It saves us. Your testimony, your confession, the words that come out of your mouth is so important. And I can't emphasize that today, church. I can't emphasize that enough. Your testimony is so important. It really is. The Bible tells us that Jesus is the high priest of our confession. And confession is literally saying the same thing as what God says about any given subject. I want to agree with God because he has a pretty good track record. What do you guys think of that? Yeah, amen. How about your emotions? Do your emotions have a pretty good track record? <laughs> no, they do not. As a devil, has he, has he been known to be trustworthy? No, 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 he's not. Jesus, we have to confess what the word of God says. And God tells us what he says in his word. So that's why we need the word of God as well. We say the same with our mouth, what God says in his word. I'm going to say that again. We say the same with our mouth, what God says in his word. Hallelujah. We just declared that. And we agree with God's word. By the way, Jesus says it's by your words that you're justified. And it's by your words that you're condemned. So the words, we're going to speak words and it's going to settle our destiny for us. Today, we want to appropriate the blood of Jesus Christ. I told you there are seven different things. There's probably a lot more, but there's seven different things. Uh, we already talked about two. I'm just going to quickly go over those first two. And this is powerful stuff. This isn't fluff. Okay? Say, this isn't fluff. <laughs> this is powerful stuff. It's the word of God. All right, last week we talked about the first thing that the blood of Jesus does for us. Redemption. Redemption. And that's salvation. Matter of fact, in Ephesians 1, 7, it says this. In Jesus, we have the redemption, how? Through the blood. The forgiveness of sins. And redemption means being bought back. See, we were sold out to the devil at one time. Our lives were lived for the devil. As a matter of fact, you're going to have to remind yourself and you're going to have to remind the devil that I used to be in your hands, devil, but Jesus bought me back with his blood. Amen? You may feel like that was my old life. So listen to me. I'm going to say this because there's someone here that needs to hear this and I don't. Some may say, I have a history and I'm just going to repeat it and I'm going to end up back the way I was. That's a lie. You believe what the Word of God says about that, okay? You don't have to believe that lie anymore. You don't have to believe like, oh, I, I can't get over this. That's a lie again also. The blood of Jesus bought you. You don't belong to the devil. You don't belong to this world. You belong to Jesus, and he loves you. He loves you. Confess it. I belong to Jesus. And when you feel like you're going to fail, you say, nah, no devil. I've been bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And the blood of Jesus is powerful. It's mighty. Hallelujah. Uh, so let's make that confession right here. I'm going I'm to say it and you guys repeat it after me. This is your confession. And by the way, I said I was going to have papers for you. I'm going to have papers for you. They're here. They're printing them right now. They're printing and they're going to be fresh. No still confessions for you guys. Here's your confession. Repeat after me. Through the blood of Jesus, I have been redeemed 
out of the hands of the devil. That is powerful. Matter of fact, it's so powerful. What I want you guys to do, why don't you guys look at someone next to you and you're going to say it to them. Oh, yeah, we're going to put the rubber to the road. Ready? Look to someone right now and repeat after me. Here we go. Through the blood of Jesus, I have been redeemed out of the hands of the devil. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes. Amen. Let that, let that sink in. You're an overcomer. And so when you feel like the devil's overcoming you, you just repeat that right now and you confess it. This is who I am. The devil would love to say, nah, I think you're this. Say, no, I am this. So it's, it's the word of your testimony in the blood of Jesus that gives you victory. The second one we learned was cleansing. The blood of Jesus, when we appropriate it to our lives, it does a cleansing in our lives. First John 1, 7, it says this. But if we walk in the light, and again, what is walking in the light? Walking in the light is doing what the Word of God has told you to do. Walking in the light is doing what God wants of us. It's living for Jesus Christ. It's not staying in darkness anymore because you used to be uh, oblivious to what sin was. Now we know as we read the Word of God, we know what sin is. And so we just say, I'm going to walk in the light. I'm going to walk in the way that God told me to do. It says, but if we walk in the light as He is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sins. How do you overcome sin? You walk in the light of God. You walk in what God's word says. It saves to the uttermost. Amen? It saves from the guttermost to the uttermost. Is that how that goes? Okay, maybe not. Anyway, we walk in it. As long as we're continually walking, listen, and that, that word there is continually. As long as we're continually walking, God is continually saving. God's continually cleansing, I'm sorry. As long as we are continually walking, God is continually cleansing you. Continually changing you. Hallelujah. So here's your confession. Here we go. Repeat after me. While I walk in the light, in the, light the, blood Jesus, the blood of Jesus cleanses me now, me now and, continually and continually from all sins. all sins. That's what the blood of Jesus does for you, church. That's how you're an overcomer through Jesus Christ. Amen? That is wonderful. Hallelujah. So we're going to go to the third one today, and we're going to go all the way through seven. Justification. The blood of Jesus gives us justification. And by the way, that's the Greek word for the justification there is talk about righteousness, being made right, being made righteous. Romans 5, 9 says this, and this is the amplified version. I'm going to put it up there, and it says this. Therefore, since we have been justified, in other words, declared free of the guilt of sin by his or by Jesus' blood, how much more certain is it that we will be saved from the wrath of God through him, through Jesus Christ? Justified. Be made right. Be made righteous. Suppose you was in a court of law and you did a capital crime. And now the punishment is coming down and you deserve the death penalty. Or, 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 let's, let's, let's go something simple. I like what, how Ray Comfort does it. Suppose you did a speeding ticket. Because none of us has really killed anyone here. At least not with our hands, right? We may have in our hearts and our thoughts. So anyway, but here's, uh, sorry, I just got him backwards there. <laughs> my heart, my thoughts. Okay, here we go. But suppose you were speeding and you got busted. Busted. And now you're standing right there and then now you have to go to court uh, and they say, all right, we're going to, boom, found guilty. But wait a minute, wait a minute. You're free to go. Why? Because someone has paid your debt. You've been justified. And so since they paid your debt, we can't hold you. And because they paid your debt, um, you don't owe anything. And because they paid your debt, it's as if you've never done it. It's over with. It's done. You've been justified. So example there. We apply the blood of Jesus to our lives. And when you apply the blood of Jesus to your life, the Bible says that you are acquitted. The Bible says that you are not guilty. Say not guilty. See, sin condemns you. When we sin, we are guilty. But the blood of Jesus comes in, and it was shed for us, and it was shed for our sins. And so now we can be not guilty in a court of law of God, in God's law, in God's court there. It also means that you've been made righteous. In other words, you've been made right with God. See, before, you were an enemy of God. The Bible says when we sin, we are enemies with God. Man, you don't want to die being an enemy of God. But when God, when Jesus comes and we trust what the blood of Jesus has done for us, he makes us as if we've never sinned before. Your confession applies the blood of Jesus. And listen to this. When God looks at you, he doesn't see that guilty person. 
He sees the blood of Jesus. And Jesus never sinned. He was the spotless lamb. He never sinned. And so when God looks at you and I, when we plead the blood of Jesus over our lives, he sees the blood of Jesus. He says, I see a righteous person. I see a holy person right there. And it's because he sees Jesus' blood over our lives. Hallelujah. Jesus makes us righteous. Hallelujah. Our goodness will never get us to heaven. Us trying to be good will never get us to heaven. The Bible calls it filthy, disgusting, putrid rags. You can't stand in the presence of God with rags upon you. But God has provided clothing for you and I. It's called the robe of righteousness. It's the righteousness of Jesus Christ. In Isaiah 61, 10, it says this, I am overwhelmed with joy in the Lord my God, for I have dressed, for he has dressed me with the clothing of salvation. You've been saved. And you've been draped, and he draped me in the robe of righteousness. I am like a bridegroom dressed for his wedding, for a bride with her jewels. Listen, God's blood saves us, but it also covers us, and it makes us righteous. I, I don't know. I, this may be a bad, this is just Terry Baldwin, okay? But many times, there's a lot of Christians out there with scarlet letters upon them. They say, you know, yeah, God's forgiven me, but yeah, I'm, I'm not worthy. God has forgiven me, but yeah, I've got this stain on me. You know, the, blood, the Bible says that God wraps the robe of righteousness around you. He just wraps it around you. And so that's your clothing. That's your wedding clothing that, so you can come into the great wedding feast of heaven. The righteousness of Jesus Christ. Not your and my righteousness, but the righteousness of Jesus Christ is what clothes us. So hallelujah. So we get two things. We get salvation and we get righteousness. You're saved and you're righteous. And God does not see your past. You are not a scarlet letter Christian. You're robed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ because of his blood. So let's make that confession today. Ready? Repeat after me. Through the blood of Jesus, I am justified, acquitted, not guilty, reckoned righteous, made righteous, just as if I've never sinned. Hallelujah. So when the devil comes and he says these things, you punch back. And says, you punch back. You punch back with these confessions of, your, of the blood of Jesus Christ in your life. This will change you and I. This will change our thinking. This will change our beliefs. If God can change our thinking and change our beliefs, then he can change our words that comes out of our mouths and we will speak the words of life instead of words of death. Amen? And Christians today, they're saved, but lots of times we still are speaking the words of death. We're speaking what the devil says about us. We're speaking about our past as though it's who we are. No, you've been made righteous through the blood of Jesus Christ. You're not guilty because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? Let's thank the Lord for that right now. Hallelujah. So we got to learn to punch back. And we punch back by the word of God and confessing it with our mouth. Number four, sanctification. That's what the blood of Jesus does for us. Hebrews 13, 12. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his blood, suffered outside the gate. The word sanctification there came from, from the word sanct. That word sanct there actually means the word saint. God makes us like saints. You know, we read in, in Catholicism that there's certain people who make sainthood. The Bible says that his blood makes you a saint. Amen? So that doesn't mean you get your own little statue or anything like that. Now, don't do that, okay? Sanctification, it's an English word that means saint, to make saintly, to make holy. Many times we feel unholy, and you know, one of the reasons why we feel unholy, because the Bible says that the devil is the accuser of the brethren. He reminds us, look at this, this is, this is who you've done, and this is what you just thought a while ago, and this is how you spoke to your children, how you spoke to your wife. This is how you did your job. This is how you failed God again and again and again. So you know what? The blood of Jesus is changing me. The blood of Jesus is sanctifying me. It's making me holy. It's making me more and more like Jesus Christ as I surrender to what he says and as I confess it and I believe it. And when I start believing it, then I'm going to start acting like it. You know, I don't know. It's an old story, and I, I don't know if it's true or not, but it was a story about them bringing these slaves over in the days on the slave trade. And a particular guy they caught was a, a son of a chief and he was very important, and, and he knew who he was. And the whole time they tried their best on the trip back was to beat them down, to take away their identity, to make them the new identity. You're nothing like that anymore. You're ours. You're a slave. You would do what we say. This is who you are. And this guy realized, I know who I am. 
and I know whose I am. I'm a son. They beat him. They beat him. They beat him. And still he had that about him because he knew who he was. Church, we need to know that. The devil will beat you and beat you and beat you. And how do we know? We, what does the word of God say about you? I don't feel like it. Who cares what you feel like? <laughs> As my mom would say, followed by a swat. But anyway, <laughs> who cares what you feel like? Amen? What's true? Say what's true. What does God say? That's what we need to say. I am, yes, Satan, you're right. I have failed. But that's not who I am anymore. The blood of Jesus is on me, and he's sanctifying me. He's making me holy. And day by day as I surrender to him, I'm more and more like Jesus Christ, whom I was created in the image of. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. So, um, let's make a confession. Here we go. Repeat after me. Through the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. I, am sanctified. I am sanctified. I'm set apart for God. Set apart for God. Separated from sin. Separated from sin. And, made holy with God's and made holy with God's holiness. Do you guys feel a confidence welling up within you? And again, this, this is the confidence in who Jesus is. This is in the confidence of his blood and what it will do for us. You'll fail. You'll drop it. I'm telling you what, that confidence, that rock, that cornerstone is there. Amen. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. So we're sprinkling the blood. Number five, what does the blood of Jesus do for us when we confess? It gives life. It brings life. Leviticus 17.11 says this, for the life of the flesh, it's in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make the atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Listen to this. The life of God is in the blood of Jesus Christ. That's pretty profound. I mean, it's, it's more than our minds really can comprehend. The life of God, the one who is the creator of all things, the one who makes the stars and makes the galaxies and makes matter and one who makes the oceans and the mountains and the world, the one who makes all the beautiful creative things and the beauty and the intricate and uh, complicated things, the one who does all that, his life is in us. The life of God is in the blood of Jesus Christ. And when we apply the blood of Jesus Christ, God's life is applied to our lives as well. And I believe this. I believe that when we uh, serve the Lord and we are totally surrendered to him more and more, that life within us, it just, it, it exudes out into our physical life as well. And we start living, it, it's different. It, it's, I think it's one of those things, it's the reason why, uh, like Moses, how, how long did he live? He lived to be old. Like 120 years, 120 years. And the Bible says he had good eyesight. The Bible said he had all these other things about him. And, and, uh, and he had a sharp mind as well. I believe that the life of God was in him and the life of God wants to be in you and I today. Not just for our physical healing and stuff like that, but the life of God is in you and I today. I want to read something to you. And by the way, there is more power in one drop of Jesus' blood. One drop than all the kingdom of darkness, all the kingdom of hell. The one drop of blood of Jesus Christ overpowers the darkness around us. Amen? So know that the blood of Jesus is upon you and is in you and that you have the life of God in you continually growing all the time. Amen. Um, John 6, 53 through 57. Now this here is going to be kind of a hard one. Um, and I'll read it. I'll just read it. Then Jesus said to them, he's talking to his disciples and all those who are following him, most assuredly, now, I'm reading from the New King James Version. You might, yours might say, verily, verily. Whenever the Bible says verily, that means pay attention. Whenever the Bible says verily, verily, pay attention. <laughs> Listen up. Focus right here. <laughs> Those with little kids. Okay. Jesus said, most assuredly, super important, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed. My flesh is food indeed. And my blood is drink indeed. For who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. When Jesus spoke these words, it freaked the lava out. 
They thought, oh, this is hard. Matter of fact, down in verse 64, it says, this is hard. Who can follow it? As a matter of fact, the Romans at that time, they accused Christians of being cannibals. They said, listen to what they're talking about. These people are crazy, eating the blood of Jesus, drink, eating the body of Jesus, drinking his blood. They're cannibals. And they would. That's one of the reasons, the excuses that they would use even to kill the Christians as well. It's pretty amazing. But many of Jesus' followers, when they heard that statement, they were mistaking a spiritual truth for physical truth. Here's, here's a problem with us in the world today. We think everything is all wrapped up only in this physical world. God is always speaking spiritual stuff because you're more than just physical. You're spiritual as well. Your soul and your spirit and you've been made alive by the spirit of God. You are more than this physical body right here. I want you to know that. And so many times the churches totally forget and negate the spiritual aspects what God wants to do in our lives. They forget that. And in doing that, we lose our power. In doing that, we lose our authority. It comes in the spiritual realm. And, but we always want to live life for the now. God says there's more than just this life. And I'm giving you spiritual truth. He, it's the same way he gave the spiritual truth to Nicodemus. Remember Nicodemus came to him in, at night? He says, you must be born again. And Nicodemus was thinking physical. Well, how can I enter my mother's womb again? He goes, no, I'm talking about spiritual stuff. I'm talking about spiritual stuff. Same thing, uh, the woman at the well. When uh, she came, and she, he says, uh, give me some water. And he says, I will give you water, living water that will bubble up out of you. She goes, well, give me that water too. She was thinking physical. Jesus was talking spiritual stuff. And here Jesus is talking spiritual stuff as well. And uh, the words that I speak to you are spirit and they are truth. And here's, here's what this is saying. This is what the scripture is talking about. Just as you take food and drink with, in, into your body and it becomes a part of you, so you must also receive Jesus when in your innermost being so that you can have life. Only Jesus gives life. Jesus is the author of life. Amen? I want you to know that Jesus is the author of life. And so when we believe Jesus, we believe what he's done in a spiritual realm for us when he died and, and he, he took his blood and he took it up to the heavenlies. And I'll talk about that later in a little bit. And he applied it to the mercy seat in, in heaven. I'm telling you what, it's a spiritual thing, but it gives us life. And we will live forever with God for what he's done. So hallelujah. So when we confess the lifeblood of Jesus Christ, it gives us life. So here's your confession. And we're going to talk about this in just a little bit. Ready? Repeat after me. Through the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus I, receive the life of I receive the life of God. Divine. Divine. Eternal. eternal. Endless life. Endless life. Thank, you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Yes. So we just need to apply that blood. We need to walk in the truth, everything that we know and believe it, that God is putting life within us. And the life of God is in you when you have the blood of Jesus on your life. Hallelujah. Um, 2 Corinthians says this, 4.16. Though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day by day. And when we confess these things, your inward man is growing your inward person is growing stronger and stronger and stronger. This flesh here, man, I tell you what, he, he's just along for the ride. <laughs> and you're going to have a brand new one, an eternal one. But your internal man, your inward man is just growing continuously when you apply the word of God and the blood of Jesus over you. So two more effects of the blood of Jesus. Number one, uh, number six, I'm sorry, two more. Number six, intercession. Intercession. The blood of Jesus intercedes for you. Uh, what would you call that today? Not an interceder. An advocate. Would you call it an advocate? Help me out here, Dan. Give me a head or no. <laughs> okay, thank you. Dan says yes. An advocate. The, the blood of Jesus it intercedes for us. It speaks on our behalf when those who can. An advocate. So here we go. Let's look at Hebrews 12, 23 through 24. This is the amplified version. But you have come. Stop. You have come. This is a past tense. Where have we come? It says that it's in our spirit. It's not talking about we physically went to heaven, but it's talking about in our spirit. It says, you have come in your spirit. And it says, to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to the myriads of angels in festive gathering. And see, when we accept the, the love of Jesus and the blood of Jesus over our lives, the Bible says, uh, spiritually, we have entered into heaven where God is. We've entered into Mount Zion. We've entered into Jerusalem, the brand new city. And why we're there, check this out. 
There's myriads of angels, angels you can't count the numbers of them, and they're in their festive array. They're in their festive, their fest, festive clothing. <laughs> if I can say that right, they're in their really good clothes. Okay, they're in their Sunday best, and they're waiting for you and I. What's happening here? Let's check this out. And to the general assembly that's there, the assembly of the firstborn who are registered as citizens in heaven, and to God, who is the judge. God is there. He's the judge of all. And to the spirits of righteousness, that's those who are redeemed in heaven, who have been made perfectly, bringing them to their final glory. And Jesus is there, the mediator of a new covenant, uniting God and man. And to the sprinkling of the blood, okay, all these things are in heaven and by the Spirit. And what's there? The sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. When Jesus died on the cross, uh, see, remember, remember I talked about when they did the uh, sacrifice of the lamb, the atoning sacrifice once a year, they would take the blood of that lamb and they would go between in the Holy of Holies and they would go between that and the uh, mercy seat. They would sprinkle the blood seven times. The Bible told them to sprinkle the blood seven times. And then the Bible says that you're also to smear it upon the east side of the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant right there where the mercy seat is on. And it says, uh, Jesus, when he died, his blood was spilled and he took it to heaven and he sprinkled it. He made a way for you and I and his blood was put upon the mercy seat for you and I. And when God sees that sacrifice, that is the final sacrifice that we need. And it's for you and I. And so the blood of Jesus is there. And the Bible says, what does it say about the blood of Jesus? The sprinkling of the blood which speaks of mercy, a better and nobler and more gracious message than the blood of Abel which cried out for vengeance. The blood of Jesus speaks for you and I on your behalf in heaven. When you don't know what to pray, when you can't pray, when you're overpowered and overwhelmed, the blood of Jesus speaks for you on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant in heaven and God's holy of holies in the temple of God. The blood of Jesus speaks for you and I. That's powerful. Think about that. What God has done for us. Contrast that with the blood of Abel. Matter of fact, that's what it did right here. The blood of Abel did this. And by the way, Abel was uh, Adam and Eve's uh, first or second son, Cain and Abel. He was the second son. And uh, Abel was killed by his brother Cain out of jealousy and out of anger. And his blood was spilled on the ground. He was the very first murder, uh, physical murder here on earth. And it says, Abel's blood was shed against his will, but Jesus willingly shed his blood for you and I. Abel's blood, it was spilled on earth, but Jesus' blood was applied in the heavenly, a holy of holies for us on the mercy seat of God. Abel's blood cries out for vengeance against the, the attacker. Jesus' blood cries out for mercy. The blood of Jesus speaks for you and I. He wants to give you mercy. He wants to give the world mercy. We have to apply it. We have to believe it. We have to claim it. Lord, thank you for your blood that speaks for me. Thank you for your blood that speaks for me in heaven where God is, where all the saints are, where angels are. It's speaking for me there. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. So like I said, there's times when you feel weak and you can't even pray and you can't catch your breath. Know this, that the blood of Jesus is speaking on your behalf for mercy. Amen. What a good God. What a God. I mean, this, it's not just cartoon gods anymore, church. We need to be growing we need to be growing in our knowledge of God and the love of God and what he calls for us to do. We need to be growing in what, uh, how we are to respond to what God says so we can make a difference in the world. It's through spiritual things that this world has changed. It's through the Holy Spirit in our lives. It's through us being obedient to everything that God has called us to do that, that's going to be a change, not just coming to church every Sunday. Take this, apply it to your life, apply it to your children's life, and speak it over you because knowing this, the enemy is going to keep speaking against you again and again and again. Hallelujah. So here's your confession. Repeat after me. Thank you, Lord, that even when I cannot pray, the blood of Jesus is pleading for me in heaven. Now let's worship God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for your blood that was shed for me. Thank you, Lord, that your blood continuously speaks now. We love you, Lord God. We don't deserve your kindness. We don't deserve your mercy. But thank you, Jesus, for your blood that gives us that. In Jesus' name, amen. One more. At least one more. 
The blood of Jesus gives us access. Say access. And this is found in Hebrews 10, 19 through 23. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence and full freedom, by the way, that word for full freedom there is a Greek word which means the freedom of speech. You have freedom to speak certain things for God, uh, uh, for your life. Let's read that again. Therefore, believers, since we have confidence and full freedom, our, uh, our testimony, we have full freedom to enter the holy place, the place where God dwells. How? By the means of the blood of Jesus. By this new and living way, this new and living way which he initiated and opened for us through the veil, as in the holy of holies. That is, through his flesh. And since we have a great and wonderful priest who rules over the house of God, let us approach God. We can approach God with true and sincere hearts and unqualified assurance of faith, having had our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us seize and hold tightly the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised the re is reliable and trustworthy and faithful to his word. So what does this tell us? You know, when you, when you get on an airplane and you're flying at 30,000 feet, and all of a sudden, fast and seatbelt lines come, fast and seatbelt light comes on and starts flashing. What does that mean? Turbulence ahead, right? Turbulence is up ahead. And that's what this is seeing right here. It says, let us seize and hold tightly the confession of our hope and, and our wavering, without wavering. And what this is saying, turbulence is expected up ahead for you and I. And what we need to do is hold tight to God. Hold tight to the word of God. Hold tight to the promises of God. Hold tight, listen to me, hold tight to the confession of what we say. See, what you're saying today, and when we give you this paper, and you're going to say it over your life every single day. When you see those things, and you start confessing what the blood of Jesus does for you, was shed for you, and wants to do for you, that's your confession. Hold tight to it. There's going to be some hard times coming, and you're going to need that. Don't let the hard times cause you to let go. Don't let the hard times and the difficult times and the devil's lying to you cause you to let go of Jesus Christ and just and go off on your own and do your own thing. Don't do that. The Bible says that in the end times, there's going to be a great uh, 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 moving away from the word of God. I, it's, that's not the right words. I'm, I, falling away. There's going to be a great following away of the word of God. People are going to fall away. Why? Because they're not clinging tightly to the confession that they made with their mouths. They're not clinging tightly to Jesus Christ. They're looking at things around them and thinking, oh, I better let go, otherwise I'll lose my life. Remember what I said last week? We talked about the scripture, the word of God says, that they did not cling to their life as something to hold on to. In other words, they were trusting Jesus Christ more than their own. They were wanting to follow the will of God more than wanting to save their own skin. And these were people who were dedicated. And these are the kind of people that the devil's afraid of. And so what we need to do when hard times come, we need to cling to the confessions what the word of God says about the blood of Jesus does for us. I am saved. I am delivered. I am redeemed. I do belong to Jesus Christ. I have access to God. He intercedes for me. All the things that the word of God says the Bible does, the blood of Jesus does for us, we cling to it. We hold on to it. So don't let go. Keep on making the right confession. Even when it seems totally contrary to what's going on, God's word holds true. Amen. Uh, at this time, I, I, I want to close. And Kim, I know uh, I, you weren't expecting it. Will you come up and play keyboards for us? Just kind of just do some of that droning stuff that you do? All right. Hallelujah. So this is our confession for this last one. Ready? Repeat after me. Thank you, Lord. That through the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus, I have access into your presence, into the holiest place in the universe. It's the blood of Jesus that gets us to God. It's the blood of Jesus that gets us in the presence of God. It gets our prayers even there. The blood of Jesus does so much for us. We need to thank God for the blood of Jesus. We need to say, I want your blood on me. I know in the world today that sounds gross and those things, but without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins, the Bible tells us. Because, why? Because the wages of sin is death, and life is in the blood. God wants to give you life, eternal life. He wants to give you victory in the world today over the devil and his lies. 
He wants to give your family victory. And you know what, parents, right now, you're the one that's going to be the covering for your children by the confessions that you make and the way you teach them as well. You are the covering for them. Do it every day. Say, come here, son. Come here, daughter. I want to pray the blood of Jesus over you right now. You have access to God. You have access to the very throne of God. God loves you. And he's redeemed you. He's bought you back. And he is he's sanctifying you. He is changing you to the very image of God. Declare those things. Speak it over them. Confess them. That's the testimony. Your words are powerful. And when we apply it with the blood of Jesus, the Bible says that we overcome the enemy. Matter of fact, I just want to go back to that, last, that scripture there. It says this. Confess. Oh, no, that's not it. It says, they overcame the enemy by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. That's how you're going to overcome. That's how your children are going to overcome as well. So we need to overcome and teach them how to do that. So redemption, cleansing, justification, sanctification, life, intercession, access, all through the blood of Jesus Christ over us. Hallelujah. We hope you've enjoyed today's message. If you have made a decision to accept Christ as your Savior or in need of prayer, we would like to hear from you. Please contact us at either 574-223-7631 or email us at admin at faithoutreach.cc. For further information on our church, go to our website at www.faithoutreach.cc or like us on Facebook. Either way, you will find information on upcoming events, archived sermons, who we are, as well as other activities going on here at Faith Outreach Center. On behalf of Faith Outreach Center, this is Roger Vogel saying, God bless and thanks for listening. Thank you.